All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how to read cyber policy papers because I think it's super important. And I've also been doing a lot of cyber policy paper reviews and I get a lot of private messages about it. And a lot of them are from people who teach international relations or are doing a PhD in cyber policy uh, or cybersecurity policy in particular or want to understand export control better. And there is a methodology. There's a method to the madness. So the first thing I want to impress upon everybody is that you should, in fact, apply a real framework to how you analyze papers like this if you're going to do a bunch of them. If you're just reading one particular paper because for some reason you're interested in the subject, that's it's still useful to know all this stuff. But uh, if you're going to do a bunch of them, and try to get a meta-analysis of what you're looking at done, then you do, need, you do need to do this. So there's four types of cyber policy papers and also cyber policy books and talks, which can be very similar to just a very long paper. And they're, they're listed here. There's database-based paper, papers. There's logical argument papers. There's this brand of them that is just a connection of otherwise known but not obvious facts and then there's new model portrayal and explanation so those are the four types of cyber policy papers they almost all fit into one of those four uh, it's useful to know which kind of paper you're reading when you're reading it and and i've i've done you know enough papers even like i just filled in this a couple days ago this is just a spreadsheet of all the papers, their grades, what I thought of them, sometimes a video review, where you can read them yourself. And I just filled in like the first 25 I could think of that I've done lately. And I'll try to keep it updated. And I made it editable by the world. And you can add your own papers and your own thoughts and all that sort of stuff there too as well. So if you disagree with my analysis, you can say, I thought it was a great paper. Um, and I haven't had any authors do that yet. so. That will be funny when they do. But also you can say, oh, I only want to look at the A's or only look at the F's because the F's can be very interesting as well. And it's, you know, when you have this kind of framework, it's, it's really not about being mean. It's about having consistent analysis. Otherwise, you won't get a general feel for the space. And uh, I wanted to avoid all the common traps that you see. And, and especially in this space, this is a, like, it's not a large set of authors that you're going to read and that introduces a certain mental bias in all of the readers because i want to agree with papers from people who i like but i also want to like like, like I, I i will like the papers that i agree with which is two separate sides of the same painful coin when it comes to analysis and likewise, some of the some people are better writers than others. You're you're more likely to like and agree with a well-written, charismatic paper, even if it is wrong. And there are many papers out there, especially because major software vendors are, have a lot of stake in this space, and they will fund papers that are intentionally meant to dis mislead you. Uh, and and so that some of these are part of you know very purposed roles and some of them are part of um, just a general trend, right? So they may not necessarily be intentional, but they definitely are sort of meant, you know, in a particular uh, PR pr purpose. So there's the common traps in our particular cyber policy space. Obviously, this framework, you could expand it to, uh, analyzing all scientific papers, right? So but what these aren't, these aren't really scientific papers in the traditional sense. These are policy papers that sometimes have some science. So there's a little bit of a, I will say, there's a little bit more of a focus on how do you analyze this particular space. That's what I'm trying to present here. So let's talk about the four types of papers. First type you'll see is, is data-based papers, right? So um, there's a bunch of these, right? And, and you can see all the data sets that people typically use. Right, so this is just a list of some of them from, from one of the universities. Um, I love it when people say they're doing research, but what they're doing is writing their opinions. I love that, it's my favorite thing about this space. Um, like when everyone calls each other a scholar, that's my second favorite thing. Um, but so there's a bunch of these data sets, right? So, and, and one thing I really liked about this particular uh, Chrome browser data set, right, is that they're like, hey, we noticed that the other data set, if you're going to do this particular kind of analysis, is actually not good. 
It's not good for that kind of analysis, right? But, but you wouldn't see that note in a paper that just used that data set, right? So the, this is, it's important to see what people say about the data sets. And this whole book, I gave it a big review when I first started doing some of the public analyses. Um, and, and, you know, obviously they base a lot of things on a data set that they've created or started maintaining or looked at, right? Here's another one. We created some data sets and then we analyzed those data sets. This is a very bad paper. Um, this is another paper. I think it's the best paper in that space, but there are flaws that people have pointed out. And I know it's important to know what those were. Um, and again, you'll start seeing this sort of thing all the time, right? So it'll be like, we looked at wine is a very common one to look at, and it has some very severe flaws when people use it and in the ways that they use it and what they use it for, right? CV, anything where you're looking at a collection of CVSS, obviously you have another problem, right? So it's impossible to say, I mean, in this case, I haven't analyzed this paper deeply, but like we can already say, hmm, let's, this is what I would look at in this kind of paper. Right, so um, here's the, the, the dark truth, is that usually the most common thing to say about your data is that you don't have enough of it to make any kind of conclusion. And another big question is, does the paper provide the data behind the analysis, but also the algorithms, the tools that they use to do a meta-analysis of that data or filtering of that data, right? So are there scripts and, you know, even if it's a Perl script that they just use to filter out the bad stuff in the data set, do they provide that to you in on a GitHub? That's an element of good science that you would hope to have, right? So probably the biggest uh, issue with this paper is because of NDAs, they can't provide you the data. They can only provide you summaries of the data, right? So you can't go and do your own analysis. In the case of this paper, they misunderstood the data, right? So here's looking at this paper in depth, you have to avoid the flaw of wanting to believe the conclusion and liking the people, right? Like many of us like these people personally. We know them, we all travel to the same conferences, but the paper itself is just straight up wrong, right? So they misunderstood the data, they tried to correct it, and I, in my opinion, still failed. So this is, this is like, these are the things we're trying to avoid, right? So just to give you some analyses of what, it, what are the mistakes we as people who read these papers are trying to avoid. And for example, with Wine, that Symantec data set, you get insane amounts of observer bias. So almost anything where they have some level telemetry results in a bias. And you have to understand what that bias is. And it's typically much more... It, they, they, a lot of people like to pretend like the bias is not that important, but usually the observer bias is humongously powerful in these types of papers, and it's almost it's kind of ruins a lot of their conclusions if you look at it carefully. I've seen people try to do surveys and then pretend those mean something. Surveys almost never mean anything, and a paper with a survey should get thrown out pretty much every time. Uh, a lot of people have, especially because people do not come from a background of any kind of technical background, a lot of people have a lot of technical misunderstandings that go into the papers. Or even if you are technical, you may not be a specialist in the particular type of data, right? I've, like, the more I try to examine incident response data, the more I understand that the depth of my lack of understanding in that particular space is humongous, right? It's very hard for me to write a paper about the strategic incident response, right? It, it would be worthless. And again, a lot of these, pay, like if you look at the data sets, a lot of them have like a natural tilt, right? So if I looked at the wine data set from Symantec, I could then say, well, it looks like uh, America is getting hacked more than China. But that's, that's just the natural tilt of the data. That's the natural tilt of where like they would naturally be looking, right? So the, if, if I started seeing the opposite effect, that's a real conclusion. If I see an effect that, that identifies with what the natural tilt of the data is, that's not real data. That's not a real conclusion, right? So that's a very common issue with this kind of paper. All right, so let's look at logical argument papers. These, are, these typically um, you know, present a small set of facts and then, uh, or, or premises and then follow it logically. And often they are trying to propose policy solutions, right? So that's the most obvious way that you'll see in this stuff. This is an example of that. 
Atlantic Council paper, countering cyber proliferation, zeroing in on access as a service, right? So they're like, look, we got NSO group and these other things. And because of that, we're going to follow through some logical things on what, what we could do and what that would result in. Here's some good stuff, right? That's the style of paper. This paper is very similar. It sort of, you know, looks at a bunch of things with regards to NATO. What is NATO and how does cyber fit into that? And it has a bunch of logical arguments in it, right? It's a style of the paper. And I think one of the things you have to do here is like look at their premises and really analyze their premises. Sometimes they just come from very weird places. So one of the papers I looked at was very sort of logical in that structure, right? And, and here's an example. It's like based on the work of sociologists, risk societies are those that as a result of cultural factors exhibit a strong societal preoccupation with negative side effects of industrialization modernization. So like they're like some societies are risk averse and some societies are risk not averse and the United States is risk averse. Therefore, the United States behaves a certain way with regards to responding to cyber attacks. And it's just like, that's the weirdest kind of argument to make. Like I understand uh, the logical flow of it, but it's not valid in this case. You can't just pull something out of some sociology thing and then expect it to work in this space, right? So. Um, one of the, ver these are, these are usually, these papers are usually very time consuming to analyze because you almost have to go back and go to at least one level of recursion on them and read the papers that they reference. And I, I would say the one that's most common for me is when people take, um, just sets of other papers that have a snippet in them that kind of agrees with them, but is in a vastly different context. So Jason Healy did this, uh, paper I think it's 2015 or something. I can't remember when he did this paper. Um, where he did like an off the shelf, like he did like an en back of the envelope estimation of the number of zero day vulnerabilities that the United States has. Like he was just like, you know, playing with it. And I have seen so many papers cited as like, this is the number. And just like, like the, the level of confidence he was giving you, which was like, eh, I'm throwing something out here. Here's just an example of what, how you could do it versus like the United States has three dozen vulnerabilities that it uses, right? And I'm like, mm, eh, that's not what the paper said. And, it's in, and even if it was what the paper said, he was giving it like an estimate with very low confidence values. He, you know, it wasn't like based on a data set that he was analyzing or something. So this is something you really do have to focus on a lot of these papers because they will just quote some random other thing, take it out of context, and then use that to continue their argument, right? So that is, this is a very common mistake that you'll see being made. Um, and again, a lot of the issues in cyber policy papers are very similar. That's what makes them fun. Uh, attaching the wrong levels of abstraction, um, not having an actual logical like flow from the premises to conclusions, you'll, you'll see flawed logic all the time. And, and what I find is really good is um, building a, a diagram of the logic that they have as a picture, because many of the formats that they are forced to use, like on Lawfare blog, for example, they aren't allowed to use like a nice table or just a diagram. They have to just put it in text, which means you have to build this huge mental model as you're reading of their logic and then decide if it's worth it. And that's really hard to do, even for people who are good at logic. So if you draw a diagram, you're going to find it just so much easier. Let me give you an example from a recent paper. This is from that Atlantic Council paper. So they start out by talking a lot about um, access as a service vendors and how you can handle those. And then all of a sudden they start talking about offensive cybersecurity capabilities and how you can handle those. And those are at very vastly different levels of abstraction, right? So this could be Metasploit right here, whereas the other one is a billion dollar company. So not the not handling the levels of abstraction and switching back and forth between them is something you'll see a lot, especially in papers that have many, many authors. So that's a very common thing. So here's an example of how you make the diagrams. And you can read this, um, you can read this paragraph and you can decide if you are in some way a super genius that mentally can destruct it as it's read, right? You simply stated the blah, blah, blah. This, there's all this stuff, all these words. And all that really means is this is the table that he's creating for you in your own head, right? He's like, look, we have three different strategic environments. They have three different sets of core features. And here is the dominant behavior because of that. 
that you're going to see, this is a predictable effect. So when you're looking at a good paper, there are predictable future conclusions, and that's part of it. So you can go back and judge, is this a good paper? Based, did it, was it correct in the long sense? So, and he also states, this is like basically the rest of the whole paper, is he's like, currently international law focuses on coercion, which has trouble applying. Right? He's like, of course it does, because these two are what you wrote the international law about. You did not write it about this one. This one's different. Very simple. Right? So this, you didn't have to read all his entire giant thing. You could just read my table, and you just get the same data. It's the same stuff. Anyway, so it's, I think it was a good paper. It got an A. Um, but that's what's going on inside it. Okay. This is, this is honestly, this is my favorite type of paper. Um, it's the connection of otherwise known but just non-obviously connected facts, right? So it turns out that birds are dinosaurs, that is how I, I write this. Once I've told you that birds are dinosaurs, you'll never disagree and you won't, you understand it immediately and it's obvious in retrospect, right? So, and not only are birds dinosaurs, but they're actually more closely related to T-Rex than the Triceratops was or the Stegosaurus. We like, we understand that because Stegosaurus is a dinosaur, Triceratops is a dinosaur, T-Rex is a dinosaur, Sparrow is a dinosaur, because it's more closely related to it. So it's just like, how could you possibly forget it? This cartoon, if someone had shown it to me when I was five, would have made perfect sense. And here's an example of the kind of paper you're going to see. Actually, you can't get this paper, uh, but if you attended the International uh, Strategic Studies Association, you would have the paper, I guess. Um, but very similar, like, you know, it's like, here's a bunch of different things that you knew, but you didn't realize the context. We're going to connect them all and, and sh show you a new picture, essentially. Another one that you can get, Emily Goldman's paper on the cyber paradigm shift, right? So these are sort of like, look, here's a bunch of stuff you already knew. Uh, this is the, the actual, this is the bigger picture that you're seeing, right? So they're going to connect the dots. Um, so th these are the best and most interesting papers, but they have some difficulties. For example, why did they choose those particular facts to connect? Does that connection make any sense? Are the motives involved clear? And when I say motives, tip typically what I mean is they will ascribe motives to various actors in, in their data, right? So they'll say like, look, did you realize that the Iranians were doing this because of that? And then this was going this because of that? And you're like, well, because it happened doesn't mean they were caused by that. You see what I'm saying? Uh, very tough. And what you'll get is a community of people that are aligned thinky thinkers orienting against another community of aligned thinky thinkers. So this is where you start seeing the battles of actual paradigms. And it's, that's why some of these are the most fun papers, but also the most frustrating because usually they're writing these papers based on a set of facts that they know that they're not telling you, right? So they may know, oh, the five things are public, 60,000 things aren't public that I happen to know, which connect all these things up top, right? So this is very much, they know the whole iceberg, they're showing you the tip of the iceberg, and they're asking you to, to understand that they know the whole iceberg, right? So these are, this is in general, um, the most interesting and the most difficult to analyze. And sometimes what you're doing is you're like, hmm, it's very interesting that like these six people seem to have access to the same set of data or the same thought processes, right? Or the same analysis processes. Why is that, right? So that's, you know, where are all these people coming from? That's, this is the fun thing. And sometimes you're just guessing, honestly. Um, so those are difficult, but some of the most fun papers. And then the other paper type that I see every time and you're going to see every time is here's a new model that I'm creating from scratch with a new terminology um, and I'm going to write about it, right? Like that's another thing that you're going to see. Um, so like prep, a framework for malware and cyber weapons, right? Or here's some system dynamics modeling that I've created that, you know, essentially a, a spreadsheet um, with, with some, some terminology like, uh, you know, I'm going to define offensive cyber for you or something, you know, like you'll see this over and over again. Um, or, you know, here's a preliminary model and this paper is full of diagrams, just all the diagrams in the whole world. You can go insane just reading all the diagrams, right? So. Um, and, and in some sense, if you look at the Cyber Solarium papers, they have a lot of this in it as well, right? So they have all these diagrams and they'll say, this is a model for how we want to think about the problem. And, and so how do we analyze those things? And the common flaws you'll, you'll get are, 
um, they are typically massively oversimplified, just massively oversimplified. And especially when they use any kind of game theory, they, like they really do they start chopping things into binaries that aren't really binaries. And you got to ask what data this model was based on, or is it just an abstraction created out of whole cloth? And why did they draw the lines where they drew them, right? So why it's, it's just, you know, and we can use any of these, but I like the prep one because it has a very unfortunate name. Like I don't think, uh, Trey Hare knew that it was also going to become or already was the um, drug that people use to prevent HIV, right? I just think like very unfortunate naming, but um, like he divides up exploitation into like all these different phases, you know, like payload is one of the, I can't remember what PrEP stands for to be honest, but you shouldn't cite this paper. Um, Honestly, there's most papers you shouldn't cite as realistically, unless you've done the analysis. Um, so you'll see that all the time. And then th that brings me to the conclusion, which is, I don't think you should cite the, the re when I give a paper an F, I don't think you should cite it, but it's up to you, right? Like you should judge your, all your papers the, the same way and have a big list of papers you've read and it shouldn't just be random, right? So it should be at some level supported in your head by some of these kinds of analyses. And if you want to just use my spreadsheet, this spreadsheet is public. If you message me, I will send it to you again, although it's on my Twitter. You can add your own comments and uh, you can add your own papers if you want them reviewed and they will get reviewed by me or by someone else um, in, a, in a pretty in a pretty similar way. And, and, and let me be completely fair. You can write better papers, right? So I feel like a lot of, people used to write papers in this environment and make the argument for the sake of making the argument and not think anyone technical with any background was going to read their paper. And that's just not true anymore. And, and so hopefully we can result in better papers overall and move the whole process forward because there is important work getting done all over the place. And I think it's, 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 hopefully getting highlighted by some of these things. If you go read some of these papers, you know, you could read every paper that mentions uh, persistent engagement that gets an A and, and be better off. That's a better way to do it than reading the ones that are Ds, right? So anyways, thanks so much for attending the stream. Uh, I did not write an entire slide. Sorry, from the comments. Alex wrote, please tell me your next slide is just all about the Harvard Belfer Center. You know, it's interesting because I don't know if the center's matter. That's, I, I, they might matter more. They might have mattered more back in the day. I think there's something to be said though. I, I wrote a big thing about this and then I had a bunch of people message me and there's a, there's a whole dynamic in the industry where there's not that many jobs in cyber policy, right? So you either get some of the think tanks or you work for Microsoft or one of the big software vendors which very much has distorted the, the, the way people write because they, have, they don't want to write anything bad about any of the software vendors, especially Microsoft, because that's where all the funding is coming from and it, they might need that job later. And that's been a huge distortion on the market and the discussion as a whole, which I think has been fairly disastrous for the industry. And I think it's also bad for Microsoft and Google and, and Facebook and whatnot. I think it's not good for them either that there's such a distorted view on this stuff um, because it just ends up hitting walls is what happens. So that's, that's the whole talk. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I know it was very short notice. I just wanted to get this off, off my head and into the world. And if you hated this talk, then that's okay too. You can, you can, um, you can write me a, a review in the slot in the in the youtube but thank you so much everybody bye yeah you're, you're gonna find it's very frustrating people get frustrated um alex wrote another thing he says it's very uh important in academia where they still have a lot of influence which is what i'm actively working against and i guess what i would say is yeah it's super frustrating and i don't have a solution to that that would be like an entire different talk on how to actually start shaping this. This is just the beginning of shaping, you know, public, I won't call it naming and shaming, but public uh, appreciation and review is an important, like we weren't getting any peer review for most of these papers 
until recently, as far as I can tell. So, um, and some of them are really good. And I think that's the other side of the story is like, there was nowhere to go where you were like, nuts, I want to read like every paper that's really good on this subject. That, you know, everyone thought all the papers were equally good. And that was definitely not true. It was, it was 100% not true. So that's all I got for you guys and girls and non-binary people. Bye.